Welcome back to Combat Mission Cold War, where I've been busy putting together the third scenario for Slytherin's Community Tournament. Just like the last two battles, the details were determined by members of the official Combat Mission Discord voting in a series of polls, this time producing a blue attack in forested terrain with the same emphasis on holding ground and destroying enemy units. Forested terrain presents some challenges for map design because it's usually not designed around humans. Urban areas are made up of buildings and because buildings need to be accessible to both people and vehicles, the way they're laid out has to conform to the logic of streets, alleyways, highways, squares, etc. This is very convenient for a video game environment because players are going to be ordering people and vehicles about. Forests are obviously more organic, and as a result it's a lot less convenient to find the crossover between a forest that looks and feels realistic, and a forest that creates interesting gameplay. Covering the entire map with trees and calling it a day doesn't give the scenario designer a lot of control over how players will engage each other, and doesn't give the players areas to focus on or think about. A game where you wander through an endless forest, occasionally bumping into the enemy with little warning, isn't just not a lot of fun to play, but a method that's going to generate a lot of wasted map space. At the other end of the scale, treating a forested map like an urban area and blocking it out with geometric shapes might be easier to make, and, importantly, easier for players to get their heads around, but it also looks and feels like an artificial environment. I should point out that both of these extremes do actually exist. There is still plenty of wilderness out there with enough tree covered square kilometres to fill a combat mission map, and there are also areas of forest turned over to commercial logging which are broken up into equal sections for industrial convenience. The trick here, I think, is finding some middle ground for our US and Soviet forces to fight over. Forests obviously offer a lot of concealment, even to some extent from aerial reconnaissance, so they're good locations for rear area activities. A good example is refueling. The Cold War was set to be a high intensity mechanised conflict with very high fuel consumption, and although refueling could be carried out directly from fuel trucks closer to the front lines, in rear areas it was much more practical to create refueling points. That's definitely the kind of objective that Blue would want to attack and Red would want to defend. All it really needs is somewhere to hide some great big fuel bladders, and a strip of ground for a company sized unit to pull into and connect up some hoses, so ideally near a road. So we could have that, defended by a platoon of Soviet infantry, but standing by to be reinforced by the next unit coming in to get refueled. As for the Americans, exactly who might end up attacking this kind of position is a good question. A static refueling point is likely to be a fair way behind the front line, so perhaps an air assault delivered by helicopter, stragglers or a stay-behind unit wandering around the woods, or some kind of US cavalry formation raging about making a nuisance of itself. This doesn't particularly help me nail down the layout of the map though. I know I need a bit of straight road somewhere, but right now the rest of the map is just forest. To get more detail, we can fall back on thinking of the map as a tactical challenge for the attacker. One key feature of forested terrain is that it affects the mobility of vehicles and infantry in different ways. Vehicles have a hard time navigating around the trees or rolling through undergrowth, in fact some heavy forest tiles are completely impassable to vehicles, but infantry can move through forests and take advantage of the cover and concealment they offer. This means that forested terrain can break combined arms teams, something which we can exploit to force decisions on the player. I've decided to give the blue player two broad avenues of attack, an infantry centric avenue of attack through the forest, and a vehicle centric avenue of attack down something like a track or a fire break. Setting this up in a kind of capital A shape, with a shorter, faster infantry avenue of approach through some vehicle impassable terrain, that the vehicles will have to bypass with a longer, slower route offers a dilemma. Splitting the force means the infantry don't benefit from the firepower of the vehicles, and the vehicles don't benefit from the extra protection that the infantry can offer in dense terrain. So there's tactical pressure to keep the force together and use the vehicle accessible route, 
but if we factor in some reinforcements for red, we can add some time pressure to encourage blue to take the infantry only route. That's a tough call, and we can give red some deployment options that might exacerbate it. Putting the terrain together then, like you've been watching in the background, is again an exercise in generally blocking things out, compartmentalizing it into sections, and then going back and adding in the details. Splitting the map into sections, in the west we've got a pylon corridor running north to south. The forest here slopes down towards the centre and a stream, which runs over heavy rock tiles. These are impassable to vehicles, so they form the barrier that breaks Blue's combined arms teeth. I could have used heavy forest tiles for this. Vehicles can't move through them either, but I wanted to clearly indicate to the players where they could and couldn't go. Most of the forest floor is covered in light forest tiles, which slow down vehicles but don't block them, and these are very similar to the heavy tiles. So to avoid confusion, and players straining to tell which type of forest tile they're looking at instead of playing the game, I haven't used any heavy forest at all, and used the heavy rocks in the stream bed as a barrier. Plus it makes the stream look good. On the other side of the stream, the forest slopes back up to a track and a bit of a shelf where the Soviet refueling point is. This is really simple, it's an open patch of forest, like a big lay-by, vehicles drive up and park next to the poles, where there's a load of hoses on the ground which I can't model, and they refuel from bladders which I've represented by slightly raised regular areas. It makes sense to cover them with earth if the refueling point is going to be there for any length of time. The whole area is on a shelf in order to stop Blue being able to fire at it from the other side of the map. Even though there are loads of trees breaking up line of sight, you do get sightline weirdness sometimes where you can see much further than you think. So there's a bit of a rise in between the objective area and the stream. As a bonus, this gives Red a tiny little reverse slope to work with, which could prove important if they have to defend against a frontal infantry attack. Beyond the objective, the forest slopes up again to the edge of the map. Further up in the east, the track splits. One half goes into the northeast corner, this is where Red's reinforcements are set to approach from, and the other goes into the centre where it fords the stream and then heads off to the far map edge. That's our basic layout. As I mentioned earlier, covering the entire map with trees is a bit too simplistic for me, so while I've marked out areas of tree cover and filled them in, I've also tried to feather the edges a bit and add in slightly smaller, thicker trees around the edges. This should make it a little harder to see through the edge of the forested areas. Mixing in trails of heavy rocks and open ground leading down to the stream also helps break up the monotony. This is also an exercise in trying to make the boundary lines more obvious. I put some heavy rocks down following the 40 meter contour and made sure to thin the trees around them a little bit, as well as giving everything above the 50 meter contour some streaks of open ground and rocks. This is partly to make it more visually interesting, but also partly to try and decrease the performance impact. Having a lot of trees on the map can stress out older machines especially, so it doesn't make that much sense to have hundreds of them sitting in areas like these areas above these contour lines where players probably are never going to go. I've also changed almost all the non-forest or rock tiles to weeds, purely because in the more autumnal tile set they're a bit reddy brown and they look a bit like bracken. It's purely aesthetic and was really time consuming, but I think it helps contribute to the feel of the map, along with a bit of light rain. With all that out of the way, along with a lot of tweaking and messing about with contours and opening up areas and all that fun stuff, it's time to think about forces. I decided pretty early on that I wanted to give Blue some M2 Bradleys. These are cutting edge in Combat Mission Cold Wars 1982. 25mm cannon, tow missiles and space for 6 dismounts. They're a very cool, fun, powerful piece of kit. Too bad they're in a forest where they have to work with some very short sight lines and worry about getting ambushed. Bradley mechanised infantry platoons are lower manpower. Only having 6 men per squad is a bit of a problem, and having more than the 4 Bradleys of the first platoon I selected seems like overkill. So I added in a standard mechanised infantry platoon in M113s to back them up. These have 9 men per squad and I gave them the heavy loadout, so they're packing two M60s and a Dragon each. That's a nice lot of anti-infantry firepower. 
setting the M113's as reinforcements to arrive at the 10 minute mark offers Blue some more choices. The Bradley infantry alone probably isn't strong enough to try and tackle the infantry only avenue of attack, but they can certainly scout it out and nail down enemy positions for the follow up infantry force to deal with. As for the Red Defenders, I went with a reinforced platoon to start with, the usual HQ team and three squads backed up by two machine gun teams and two extra RPG teams. This is probably strong enough to hold off the Bradley dismounts for a while, and the ford over the stream in the centre is a dangerous choke point for the vehicles who really do need to worry about those RPGs. But the Soviet player also really needs to be careful about how they split their starting force up. If they concentrate their forces to defend the objective, they might succeed in holding off the dismounts but then get wiped out when the Bradleys appear on their flank. If they focus on blocking the ford, they might find themselves struggling to hold the refueling point from blue infantry attacking across the centre. Red's reinforcements, their quick reaction force, are another reinforced platoon. This time though, they're all mounted. It's a BMP-2 platoon, so also a cannon armed IFE like the Bradley, backed up by a T-72 and a Shilka AA vehicle. The T-72 is a serious threat thanks to its frontal armour. It can easily take out Bradleys with its 125mm main gun, while the Americans plink 25mm cannon fire off it. The Bradleys do have tow anti-tank missiles that can deal with it, but these are going to be a lot less reactive than the T-72's gun, and given the very restricted vehicle terrain here, engagements are probably going to be quick draw head-to-head -head shootouts. The Shilka, on the other hand, has four 23mm cannons, so it will absolutely shred blue infantry, especially in the forest because the HEI shells will detonate on the trees. It's an absolute beast, but very lightly armoured and vulnerable to American AT weapons. If the red player can get the Shilka into a position where it can cover the objective or hose down Blue's main infantry avenue of attack, then it's going to cause absolute carnage. Of course, the interesting part here is whether or not he can actually get into a good position. There's only one road leading from Red's reinforcement area to the objectives in the Ford, so if Blue can block or seriously contest that, the Soviet player will have a big problem. If they do get bottled, they still have the option to send their infantry through the woods to get on the objective though. There's another line of heavy rocks that will block vehicles, but the dismounts can cross it no problem. I did spend some time trying to give Red some trucks, some Urals to stand in for fuel trucks or transport for the technical staff running the fuel point, but it didn't really work. Just adding trucks in would give Red a load of unarmed vehicles that Normal players would find annoyingly useless, and devious players would bum rush down to the fore to use as an impromptu roadblock. Setting the vehicles to dismounted in the editor would work, but they could still be deployed in the deployment zones as roadblocks, and if the battle took place on the higher difficulty levels, they would all be consolidated into ammo crates. So with the trucks basically just being set dressing, I stopped trying. I'm not sure how well balanced this is, but again like the last two missions this is intended to be played in a tournament setting as a mirror match. Players will play both sides and have their scores aggregated, so balance isn't a huge consideration. Finally, moving on to the objectives, Blue has a very simple set. 600 points on the table for exclusive control of the refueling point, then 200 each for causing casualties to Red's starting units and reinforcements. Red has a slightly different focus, with just 400 for the refueling point and 600 for the US force. That's split into 200 for the Bradleys, or 50 points each because they're all shiny and new, 200 for the Bradley dismounts, and then 200 for the platoon in M113s. The difference in emphasis is pretty much entirely narrative. Blue really wants to take out this refueling point. Red probably has loads of them and is much more concerned with taking out the American units zipping about behind its lines. I did consider adding in more ground objectives, for example the crossroads on red side of the stream or the ford, but decided to keep things simple. This is a small scenario, pretty much two platoons versus two platoons, so I don't want to overcomplicate it. The refueling point itself is almost entirely open. There's a little cover for infantry on red side where they can hunker down behind the fuel bladders, but Fundamentally, Blue will either have to dominate the slope opposite with fire, or send a flanking party round to roll up any red defenders. 
There are certainly ways that Blue can do both of those things, but how it pans out is going to depend a lot on how player-made decisions interact once people start playing the game. So that's a quick run through of how I made this scenario. Like with the other two, I'm really looking forward to seeing how people tackle it. Another big thanks to Slytherin for the opportunity to make some tournament scenarios. I've really been enjoying this. I really hope you all get a lot of fun out of them and get to make some interesting tactical decisions. Hope you all enjoyed this video. I'll catch you in the next one.